Hi folks, 304 stainless steel. It has a reputation as being a more difficult material to machine. We did a video a while back showing how to do some basics on drilling and adaptive machining on it, and I felt good. And then I got my butt kicked by it on a job uh, a few months ago where we had to take some 304 plate and we had to machine it down uh, relatively thin cuts to get a precise thickness. And it was those thin cuts that I just, I really struggled with. I blew up a bunch of tools, face mills, end mills, and I just was frustrated. And so I said, okay, let's figure this out. And we went through, we tested a bunch of tools, a bunch of recipes, and we've got a really good, reliable way to deck 304 stainless steel, to take thin cuts, to get good surface finishes, good process reliability, and just a good looking part. And then I thought in conjunction with that, let's tackle engraving because that's another thing that can be easy once you get it nailed down. What's the right tool? What's the right recipe? And a little cliffhanger, we found out another variable that I wasn't expecting that made a huge difference in whether this worked or didn't work. So we'll dive into that. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So you can go Google 304 stainless steel and machining and you'll read about work hardening and things like keep the tool moving, uh, avoid things generally like high speed steel. 304 can be difficult and it can be much more difficult than our typical aluminum or mild steels or even 4140s. But generally speaking, once you've figured out a recipe, it works pretty well. Drilling and definitely tapping can every once in a while throw you for a loop. Also, pro tip, if you have the ability in your budget or with your customer to use ProDeck, it's like a higher end, better machinable 304 stainless steel. Some of the folks I know who do a lot of 304 say it's absolutely worth it, uh, especially if you've got to do things like really deep drilling or tapping or a lot of tapping, etc. So just wanted to throw that out there. We're starting with the Lakeshore 20 degree engraving end mill. We are engraving this as it came from the mill. So it has that scale or the texture to it. Looks totally different versus 304 stainless that has been machined or faced. Running at 10,000 RPM, eight inches per minute, which is four ten thousandths of an inch feed per tooth. Yes, very low. Equally important is the plunge rate, two inches per minute. You wanna be very slow and gentle when you're plunging into that material. We're using the trace operation in Fusion 360 with, in this case, axial offset of 10 thousandths of an inch. What was interesting to me about engraving with the mill scale on is it was less prone to creating a burr. We'll come back to that. After that, same setup where we still have that unmachined top. This time, instead of using a proper engraving tool, we're using a carbide 60 degree center drill. The key is carbide. If you have one of these laying around your toolbox, it's probably high speed steel. But what I love about this tool is it's double ended for 10 bucks to $5 end mill. That's cheap. Using the exact same speeds and feeds, 10,000 RPMs, eight inches per minute cutting, two inches per minute plunging. However, I only went down five thousandths of an inch because it's such a flat tipped tool, I didn't want to go further because you're going to get a wider engraving path with a shallower depth of cut. For you sharp-eyed folks out there, you may have noticed that the cam tool path for this operation is not using the correct tool. That's because frustratingly, Fusion doesn't let you program trace operations with center drill. So I have to use a chamfer tool to get the tool path, obviously in the machine I'm using the center drill. Next up, let's face this part off. So this is what kicked my butt. Taking really thin axial depths of cut can cause some other problems like wearing out the tools or not being able to dump that heat into the chip, which can then cause again that material to work harden and it will just destroy your tooling. We are using the DieJet QM Mini modular insert head. Tormach sells it here and we are using, and this is important, the high feed mill We'll put all the links in the video description for this, as well as this cam file. Those high feed milling inserts are the first ones listed, part number 38161. Here's what's really cool about the high feed milling strategies. You're making a real chip, even though you're only cutting five thousandths of an inch deep. And the way you're doing that is you're kind of making a trade-off. It's a really thin cut, but it's really fast. Our programmed feed per tooth is seven thousandths of an inch. You can potentially go even higher, but this recipe 
300 surface feet per minute, 7,000 feet per tooth with a 0.15 inch step over, I have found works great. We are running the Tormach 770 on low belt. You can get by with this recipe on the high belt, but you've got a little bit more torque at the slower RPM in the low belt. Okay, so this is cool. Let's take a look at the surface roughness average with our profilometer. Because the high feed mills, they tend to leave an aesthetic mark, and I think that's due to the cutting action and the axial forces, but it's actually silky smooth, and it's a part I would be proud to send a customer. Um, so we went over this guy last week on our mirrored finish, or two weeks ago, I should say, but we turn the dial down until we get it close to touching Okay, there we go. We can actually, I got it there uh, unusual. You usually have to use the blue dial and cycle, cycle start, 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 stop. It drags that needle across. Huh, 33. I got a much better one a second ago. Thirty-one. Okay, so we're getting between 33 and 31. I wanted to take that measurement a few different spots to make sure it wasn't a materially different reading, um, depending on whether where we were on the overlap uh, or the cutting line of that high feed mill. A little bit higher. I'm getting 43 on a couple of spots. Move it back one more. So like we talked about in the mirror video, a roughness average or profilometer reading isn't necessarily gonna tell you whether the part's pretty or not, but it can give you a lot of idea of how uh, even your cutting face is, and in this case, how basically how smooth it feels. And what I wanted to show, the reason I like being able to use the profilometer on this part, is that if I just looked at this part from a distance, it, it has a very cool pattern, almost like an engine turning uh, style look, but you could see walking up to that part and saying, oh, that's really rough, I don't like that. Uh, or you could feel it and you say, oh, okay, hey, that's actually a really good uh, feeling. And the engraving, I think, also looks great. Clean some of that debris out of there a little bit, and I think we've got a pretty good recipe. Now that the part is faced and we are engraving on a machined surface, and we're back in high belt, same recipe, same feeds and speeds with the Lakeshore engraver, I thought this was going to be cake. It actually kicked my butt and it kicked my butt because it kept raising a burr. Now, oftentimes with an engraving tool, if you go a little bit deeper with the engraving, you can help prevent that burr. You could also repeat pass with the engraving tool, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be a relatively burr-free cut the first time around. And we had relatively similar burr problems with both the Lakeshore tool as well as the center drill. So what was that factor that really made a difference? Coolant. It's a good example of where your normal fog buster just isn't going to cut it. We made it work here by cranking up the fluid mix on the fog buster so you have that ponding effect. You're effectively treating it like a low end flood coolant system. But it's a good example where you just can't have enough coolant and enough pressure to help lubricate that cut and flush those chips out. So we did that 10 thou depth of cut again and very few problems, much, much more minimal burr. So of the two tools we tested today, I love them because they're both relatively inexpensive. The nano-coated double-end Lakeshore engraver is $27, or about $13 per cutting edge, and the carbide number one spot drill, it has to be carbide, technically a center drill, excuse me, is 10 bucks, double-sided, $5 per side. I feel like if I had a mystery metal or I was really concerned, I would probably use the center drill. It's cheaper and I like to keep my Lakeshore engravers in good condition. Um, I'd probably just see how it worked on the center drill first. Um, on that note, 
if at all possible, I would highly encourage you to try to keep your tooling separated by material. You really don't want to use an aluminum tool and stainless and vice versa. You can have edge wear or built up edge or other material contamination that can compromise the cut. And what's frustrating about that is if you have a problem, you don't know if it was your own feeds and speeds or something else or just the fact that the cutter had been compromised from mixing materials. And finally, to get rid of those burrs, don't laugh, you can actually use a straight razor scraper to kind of scrape them off. It works, but a better way, come back and deck it again. You can deck it on the same Z plane. You can deck it at say one thou or even less above the part. So you're just knocking off the burr and not recutting the material. Or a really good workflow can be, let's say you have a 10 thou deep face. Face it down nine thou, do your engraving, and then come back and deck off that last thousandth of an inch such that your engraving is left remaining, really good mix. Again, a shout out to my buddy Tyson Lamb. Tyson makes some really awesome golf putters, does a lot of work with stainless, and has been really helpful in some of the speeds and feeds and other little tricks on these recipes. Don't be scared of stainless. It's really not that bad, and if you, again, the 304 specialty stuff like the Pro Deck is even easier, and if you've done 304 and you hop over to 303, walk in the park. Hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed. Take care, see you soon.